this road. Words about myself, uh, and then give you a rough sense of the structure of the evening before introducing my very famous and celebrated guest for the evening. So first of all, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm not from around here. Um, I used to, in a previous life, would you like some water? Run a, a physics institute in Canada. And one interesting aspect of that experience was that through a series of public events and outreach, I learned that it could be a very, very useful and engaging process to deal with celebrated individuals in a conversational format. Deal with is perhaps not the best choice of words, but to engage individuals of, uh, of an illustrious character through conversations. And in that way, one has an opportunity to move beyond the standard lecture format and get a clear sense of the guest's orientation, intellectual development, and dare I use a word which has been considered taboo in my uh, discussions previously with Honora, motivations, to which she'll have the opportunity to doubtless give me a rebuttal of, of sorts. Um, let me now move to how we envision the conversation will play out for this evening. So I will be speaking to uh, Honora in, on three different topics. I'll be speaking to her uh, and questioning her about her intellectual development, her philosophical development, and then move on to some issues of present day relevance and concern and her long experience, which has been informed by public policy and her intellectual orientation and philosophy. And then the last part of the evening, we'll have the opportunity to hear from Honora in terms of her speculations of what might happen in the future, her uh, any fantastical possibilities that she might be inclined to uh, ruminate on, as well as uh, her thoughts of the role of philosophy in the public sphere, her thoughts on the development of philosophy and so forth. And then we'll also open up the floor for questions from all of you and we'll have the opportunity to have an engaged discussion with you and Baroness O'Neill. So to begin, I'd like to give you just a very short biography of my illustrious guest this evening. Honora O'Neill studied philosophy, psychology and physiology and for reasons which I can't, for the life of me, understand. You Brits tend to group undergraduate degrees in terms of disparate topics that start with the letter P. Um, perhaps one day there'll be a physics, podiatry, and parachuting course. Maybe there already is. Um, nonetheless, she was an exemplary student at Oxford before moving on to do her PhD at Harvard under John Rawls. Thereafter, she took up teaching positions at Barnard College, at Columbia University, at the University of Essex, and then moved on to be the principal of Newnham College, Cambridge. Um, and in uh, 2013, she was the Spinoza Chair at the University of Amsterdam. Um, she has served as the president of the British Academy, of the Aristotelian Society, of the British Association of Philosophy, and she has an impeccable academic pedigree and is considered one of the leading philosophers of her generation. All of this is deeply impressive. Um, it is made even more impressive by her remarkable contributions to public policy. So perhaps I should say, right at the moment, she is the president for the Society for Applied Philosophy, 
which is very interesting because every time I try to use the word applied to you, you give me a hard time. So perhaps it should be considered the Society for Enacted Philosophy no, or it, Instantiated it Philosophy. It is their name, it is their name. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps you've tried to get the name changed and, and doubtless you will have some success in the future doing so. Um, but that is the second part of what I wanted to comment upon, not only does our guest have absolutely impeccable and remarkable academic credentials, but what I think really separates her from so many of her illustrious peers and colleagues is her highly significant and accomplished role in the public sector and her ability to become involved in public policy and the public sector in such a way that not only does she make such salient contributions in doing so, but she does it through an informed philosophical approach. So she is living proof that philosophy is not some airy-fairy, detached uh, intellectual exercise which need not have anything to do with the real world in which we find ourselves, quite the contrary. Through her many uh, levels of experience in public policy, being at chairing the Human Genetics Advisory Commission, being at chairing the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, being at chairing the Nuffield Foundation, being at chairing the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Honora has remarkably combined philosophical insight with uh, an informed and enlightened higher level of debate in public policy to all of our credit. In 1999, she was awarded a life peer and sits as a crossbench member of the House of Lords. Ladies and gentlemen, Honora O'Neill. Now, the approach that I would like to take is an informal conversation. I had the delight to be able to have a similar conversation with Honora a few days ago, and I would like to continue in a similar vein by having such an informal conversation, which means obviously we have the opportunity to drink water, we have the opportunity to answer truthfully and candidly to whatever the other person says, and hopefully she will have the opportunity to engage in a similar candid and honest way with members of the audience later on. So I thought we'd begin with your philosophical evolution. And it seems to me that there are three highly salient aspects to what it is that you've done in terms of your philosophical accomplishments and orientation and, and how they might apply to public policy later on. So uh, I don't want to in any way imply that, I'm, that your accomplishments can be limited to three or four or five or anything like that. But when I look at what it is that you've done, one of the things that strikes me as the most significant is your emphasis on duties and your emphasis on the fact that despite the fact that we live in a culture which is very much oriented towards rights and human rights in particular, duties have to play a preeminent role. So what I'd like you to start with is perhaps talk about some aspects of how that began. And in the preface that you gave me recently, I think you set it up very well by describing the socio-historical uh, context to duties and how what came to be a central thrust in aspects of your philosophy was actually quite unorthodox and very much against the grain of, of the time. Well, thank you. I think it's curious, isn't it? In our everyday lives, we uh, use the word ought all the time. Um, So-and-so ought to have done such and such. I ought really to do this. Um, and we take it for granted that life is full of duties. Some of them are ethical duties, some of them are legal, some of them are, uh, as it were, uh, in our employment, in our families and so on. Duty is commonplace still. But it's very curious that in uh, 
philosophical writing in ethics in the last century, really since I think the beginning of World War I, uh, people have got very suspicious about duties. Have you noticed nowadays people often say, oh, that would be inappropriate, as though it was like wearing an orange skirt with a pink jumper, or like wearing uh, your most bold floral tie to a funeral. Inappropriate. It's a, uh, a sign of sort of timidity when people say something's inappropriate, or it's a euphemism. It, uh, my 10-year-old grandson told a rather uh, perhaps a robust joke the other day, and he said, Granny, it's really very inappropriate, uh, which pleased him a lot. But how did we come by this idea that, what, that, it, that we shouldn't use the notion of duty? And I think the history is really, takes us back to, it was utterly commonplace a century ago. And then at the beginning of World War I, as I read it, people thought duty, ah, that's patriotic duty, duty to king and country, duty to Kaiser and country. And the noblest form of duty is, of course, the ultimate sacrifice to be killed for your country or to kill for your country. And given what World War I, as you all know, turned out to be, that was a pretty catastrophic uh, view. And duty was deeply discredited. Um, the novelist E.M. Foster, whom I'm sure some of you have read, uh, wrote Between the Wars, uh, if I had the choice between betraying my country and betraying my friend, I hope to God I'd have the guts to betray my country. Now that's putting patriotic duty way out on a limb. But you know, this would perhaps not have made a big cultural change, but I'm afraid the intellectuals got in on the act, and with logical positivism, Vienna, 1930s, there was this sudden thought that it was really disreputable, intellectually disreputable, to ask these questions about ethics or politics or uh, indeed about metaphysics or um, religion, and that what we should do is to stick to verifiable claims, so just empirical claims or logical analysis, but that everything else was, this was their phrase, literally meaningless. That meant, of course, everything about duty was literally meaningless. So, of course, no society can live like that, and uh, one of the, the worst catastrophes of the century was, of course, World War II, at the end of which, Eleanor Roosevelt and others said, no, we've got to reinstate somehow ethical standards. That's where the Universal Declaration of Human Rights comes in, 1948, as I'm sure you most of you know. And uh, it was rather vague, rather waffly, uh, but it firmly said that there were rights. To me, the fascinating things, thing about this is why the reversal of perspective? Why look at rights, not duties? Why switch from the ancient question, what ought I do, where you're thinking of yourself as somebody who does things, to the uh, recipient's question, what ought I get? What are my rights? What are my entitlements? Couldn't it also be considered that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was uh, a manifesto, was wishful thinking? Uh, that, that, that people put it out there not in terms of a legitimate exchange, understanding the philosophical dynamics or what have you, but that this would be a good thing to have without any clear sense as to how it might actually come about. I think people wanted to have it both ways. On the one hand, they wanted the standards in the Universal Declaration just to be standards uh, that were somehow good things to have out there. But on the other hand, they also wanted them to be uh, something that people were entitled to. Now, entitlement doesn't come without institutions, laws, enforcement, and the rest of it. Hence, you get the human rights movement uh, trying, and the various stages to this, to make sure that human rights were actually delivered or to use the phrase in the later covenants of 1966, um, valid since about 1976, uh, that they were realized. Now, my view is very simple. You can't realize 
anybody's rights without somebody or some institution having the counterpart duties, which is why I've come to the conclusion, if we want to be serious about rights, we better be serious about duties. That's simple. But, so I, I'd like to trace your philosophical evolution because I'm sure some people in the, in the audience and more broadly are aware of the fact that you are a Kantian. Mm -hmm. And Honor O'Neill, the great Kantian, without necessarily understanding what that means, or how you became a Kantian, or what it means for you to be, to be a Kantian. So my understanding is when you came to Harvard, in light of this uh, widespread societal understanding that, well, we have these, we have these duties, or, or rather we have these human rights, but um, we're not really certain about duties, or we don't want to talk about duties. You mentioned World War I and dying for king and country and so forth, and the, the notion of duty was, let's just say, given rather bad press, and people were pulling back from that, that sense. And here you come as a, as a young graduate student to Harvard, and you're trying to get an understanding of the principles of moral behavior and moral action and whether or not, in fact, there can be principles for moral action and moral behavior. How we can use our reason in such a way as to actually know what's right and what's wrong and commit moral acts. Is that, is that a fair uh, assessment? And then what happens from there? Well, I think you have to keep much more separate the question of where the culture is. The culture has never given up on duty. That's the sort of thing that we tell one another in our everyday lives, and we tell our colleagues, you ought to. Um, and uh, it is, I'm afraid, uh, the intellectuals and the philosophers uh, who rubbished, of course, initially, not just duties, but the uh, logical positivists were rubbishing rights as well. Mm -hmm. what you, one way you can see the Universal Declaration of 1948 is an attempt, let's get back the rights, and then, the, you know, then everybody ought to make sure that other people's rights are respected. But they didn't actually supply the institutions to do so. Uh, that's really what changed in the 1960s and 70s with the uh, in, uh, two covenants that say, well, uh, the duties belong to the states. But think about it, is it the state that can deliver all these rights? Well, sometimes, sometimes not. Out there we have states that have no intention of respecting human rights, we have states that have no capacity to respect them, and we have contested views of what the the rights are. So trying to just load the duties onto the states that signed up uh, was always going to be a rather fraught enterprise. Okay, but if I may interject. So here, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show that the illustrious philosopher to my left is a great Kantian scholar who's able to combine uh, Kantian principles and Kantian ethics with real world situations. And I would like to move towards a scenario where I can understand what that actually is. Why were you influenced by Immanuel Kant and, and how did that actually develop? Uh, in the background, there's one very simple thought, isn't there, which is that of all the philosophers who, who wrote on ethics, probably Kant is most associated with the notion of duty. By no means alone, all the classical philosophers thought it was important. But uh, Kant emphasized duty, and he thought that we could give reasons why these and these and these were requirements of duty, but those and those and those other things were not. And that's you know, the big challenge, that's the high jump. What I was looking for when I was starting out in philosophy was whether his arguments held water at all, or whether they were uh, promissory notes which were totally discredited, which was widely believed. And in acting on principle, you examined specifically the categorical imperative. And why, why did that particularly appeal to you? Um, it's not oh, it didn't appeal to me hard. It didn't appeal to me one bit. I thought it was absolutely rebarbative. So Everybody does when they meet it first. It is uh, um, act only on that principle through which you can at the same time will that it be a universal law. That's one of the formulations. And you think, what? 
what's that? So, no, it didn't appeal to me, um, but I was looking hard uh, for serious arguments in ethics. What I found was a tremendous welter of uh, what I would call soft substitutes for serious arguments, particularly people, uh, and you, many of you will know this from reading bits of economics, who would appeal to the preferences people have, or they would say things, very subjective things, like, those are my values. Well, my values might be this or that, but the fact that they're mine can surely not be what makes them valuable. And yet very often, people offer no more than saying, those are my values. These are the values of my business, of our corporation. Our company has these values. So I was trying to look for some of the justification, but I didn't want to beg the question, of course. I was perfectly aware there might not be justifications and that uh, the logical positivists might have been onto a convincing as well as a, a flamboyant set of slogans. So how did you gradually become seduced by the merits or the potential merits of the categorical imperative? Well, seduction was not what it felt like, you know, uh, seduction. Um, I, I read the texts, I read them in English, I read them in German, I uh, looked at them uh, with a beady eye, and uh, there were many times when I thought, uh, this is not very plausible. And I suppose what's interesting is, when you're reading difficult material, what uh, uh, tactic do you bring to interpreting it? And uh, I know people, I'm sure all of you know people, who have a sort of black museum approach. They're reading something difficult, and they think if they can get the most ludicrous possible interpretation, that's interesting. Well, it can be interesting in a sort of quickie way. But I have to say that I go the other way. I think that if an author's worth reading, it's worth trying to make sense of what they say. And, and it was about as simple as that, the approach that I brought to reading Kant, that you've got to try to make sense of it. Um, and uh, it was a struggle. Uh, now, if, do you want me to try the high jump and try and say what I think the basic argument is? Absolutely. Okay, here goes. Um, if I'm to give you a reason, a reason for believing something or a reason for doing something, I better give you something which I think, in the case of believing, that you could follow in thought. It's absurd if I give you something incomprehensible. That's not giving a reason. Uh, that's just talking past someone. If I want to give you a reason for action, then I better give you a reason that you could adopt as a principle of action. It would be absurd to give you something which you couldn't possibly act on. So I was looking at the basic strategies for communicating with other people that we all have to use every day. We know that if we talk past people, we won't have communicated, and that really good communication means that I adjust what I say to something you can follow, you adjust what you say to something that your interlocutor can follow, and we all start communicating. Now, that, that's true of any sort of communicating. That's not particularly just ethical reasons. But if we have ethical principles, we sort of hope that they could be principles for everybody, that they would be principles that could be given as reasons to, this is Kant's phrase, the world at large, that you could say of something like, don't tell lies, you could give a reason for it, uh, which would work for everybody. And so that's what I started looking for. You may want to come in here, Howard. To, uh, well, uh, a, a, few, a few points. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like you to describe, maybe I'll just back up. My understanding is that this ties directly with a sense of universality and universalism. You talked about how these principles could be used by anyone. The, that doesn't necessarily mean, as you pointed out, that they necessarily lead to agreement or consensus, but the notion of engaging in a dialogue with someone 
towards an end of using principles that could be applied to each one of those individuals, or that each one of those individuals could r resonate with. Well, could be used by each one of those individuals, not could be applied to them, but could be used right, by there's them. there's that word again. So I'm, <laughs> giving, I'm giving my interlocutor a principle that she can follow or uh, and thought. Uh, now, universality in Kant then has two facets. One is the thought that um, it's a principle, so it is formally, what shall we say, uh, everybody should tell the truth. Nobody should bear false witness against his neighbor. Everybody uh, uh, should refrain from theft, whatever it may be, you know. We all know these pr uh, principles. But it's not merely that it's a principle that has a universal form, it's also a principle that could be adopted, enacted by everybody. And I think that, a, that it's as simple as that in a way. If you stick to principles that could be principles for all, there are few principles you're going to have to say, not that one, not that one, not that one. And the sort of principle you have to discard would be, for example, a principle like, um, I will coerce others. Or, and I could act on that principle, but I cannot imagine a world where everybody acts on the principle of coercion. Why? Because if everybody adopts this, that principle, some people will actually go and do some coercing, and then there will be some people whose agency is impaired and limited by others' coercion. It can't be a principle for everybody. And ultimately, Kant's idea is simply don't act on the principles that you, you don't leave others free to act on. So he's giving us a criterion for rejecting certain principles. Reject the principle of coercion, of deceiving, of breaking promises, um, of lying, and, and many others, of course. So that's, uh, it now sounds rather simple to me, but I have to say getting there of these rather difficult texts was, was a, a hard slog. So we have two aspects. Mm. We have the primacy, or at least the importance, the often overlooked importance of duties, which mm. I, I hope we'll come back mm. to. We have this universalism that you've just mentioned. And there's another aspect, which in your later work, I believe, you, you touch upon. And that has to do with uh, perhaps a corollary of this notion of individuals interacting in a reasonable way, which is to say that some people, when they read Kant or when they hear Kantian arguments, they talk about autonomy. And they talk about autonomy, whether they're talking about Kant or, or others, in terms of autonomy of uh, the reasoner. Autonomy of reason being this mm -hmm. self-contained individual, this Cartesian individual, if you will, who's looking at the primacy of thought and the primacy of his rational argumentation and so forth. My understanding of, of what you believe in terms of uh, Kantian philosophy is that, that Kantian ethics and what he means by the moral law involves the autonomy of reason insofar as it's the autonomy of reasoning, the process of reasoning, rather than the autonomy of the reasoner, which, but, which implies this idea of people interacting. Again, getting back to what you said uh, about individual agents that could be persuaded by this particular principle or line of, uh, of argumentation. And that necessarily involves dialogues, and that's a much more social form of human interaction, which is why, as I understand it, you believe that Kant has a, a primacy in terms of politics and culture and, uh, and human behavior when he talks about reason. Is that a fair summation? Bits of it are. Uh, it was very difficult, but thank you. Um, Kant on autonomy. I have to say this wasn't uh, my insight. One of my Harvard contemporaries, a man called Thomas Hill, who teaches at Chapel Hill in North Carolina, uh, simply noticed that Kant never talks about autonomous persons. He talks about autonomous principles. He talks, indeed, sometimes about the autonomy of reason. But this made me very curious about where did we get this idea of the persons being autonomous? And I'm sure many of you know this. Post-World War II, existentialists start talking about 
uh, the importance of individual autonomy. Now we know why they started talking about that. For them, it, it was a sort of salient, terrible thing that so many people had kowtowed to terrible political events and processes during the years of World War II. But individual autonomy uh, went far beyond the existentialists. It became one of the leading popular ideas of the post-World War II world. And you have about, I don't know, let's guess, is it 20, is it 200 slightly differing conceptions of what makes an autonomous person? And I suddenly realized that that wasn't what Kant was talking about, so he meant something different about or by autonomy. What did he mean? Well, the word autonomous just means self and law, those two words, autos, nomos, two Greek words. He, all that he meant was the principle that didn't assume something arbitrary, which he would call a heteronomous principle, the law of another. So an autonomous principle, the principles that I just was giving examples of that can be picked out by using the categorical imperative, he calls autonomous principles. The funny thing is, other people using the word autonomy, like Kant, went on using the classical jurisprudential sense of the term. An autonomous principle, it's something about the principle, not about the individual who uses it. And uh, I had a most curious experience one day. I was reading a well-known book on John Stuart Mill, and I read that Mill, in whose work, rationality and autonomy are the two leading ideas. I thought, that's funny, I don't remember where Mill talks about autonomy. Well, with the wonderful help that we can, of course, search the texts mechanically now, I looked for the word autonomy in John Stuart Mill. Nowhere in, in his work Utilitarianism, nowhere in his work on liberty, but one use it which gave me the clue in his essay on representative government, where he uses it in the classical ancient sense. An autonomous city is a city that gives itself it lo its laws, and uh, as a contrasted with a colony, where the mother city gives it its laws. And Mill actually doesn't talk about individual autonomy. He talked about individuality, which is rather a different thing, but that was very instructive to me. So I then went and looked at all the passages and count on autonomy, and a very kind graduate student hoiked out, excuse me, every single passage, and it's quite true, Kant does not speak of autonomous persons. Great weight off my shoulders, because it looked to me as though it wasn't going to work if he talked about autonomous persons. How do you fit that with the other things? Answer, he doesn't. So that's part of the, the, mm. the story on autonomy. Uh, and I'm not saying, by the way, that the post-1945 conceptions of autonomy are unimportant, although I think a lot of them uh, probably uh, have their problems. So in some of your public works, the Reith Lecture, for example, mm. yeah. um, you, talk a, you talk about trust in many mm -hmm. different ways. And I'd like to make a link uh, from the philosophy that we've just been discussing or that you've just been mm. discussing to some aspects of public policy that mm. I think we can mm. all identify mm. with. So I'd like to make uh, a very unexpected lurch from Kant's view of autonomy to Donald Trump, if you'll, if you'll bear with me Joy. For, for a moment. Um, so, in, in the, you're, I'm, I'm sure you're very excited to see where this is going. Um, so, in your reflections on trust, you talk about the importance of trust, you examine whether or not we really are living in a time of a crisis of trust. This is in 2002, so this is some 14 years ago that you gave these lectures. And my sense is that, that trust is an essential topic to consider if one lives within this universal framework, because if we're all to interact with each other and we're all to be uh, considering principles in terms of whether or not they can be fit for everyone else, then it's essential to be living in a community, living in a culture where trust is, uh, is preserved. Um, and one of the areas that you examine, specifically, 
is the media. And you ask yourself, is the media trustworthy? Are they doing a good job? And you provocatively talk about whether or not the media has, uh, as you say, it's important to have a free press, but that doesn't mean that they should have a license to deceive. So my first question to you, as I veer precipitously towards Donald Trump, uh, as advertised, is have things changed? You alerted us in 2002 to the media perhaps not living up to their expectations and what it is that they should be doing. Um, have they gotten any better? No, they've got worse. Um, but uh, let, let me try to justify that claim. Uh, I think trust isn't the basic topic that we need to think about. It's actually trustworthiness. An example that I use from time to time uh, of that is, uh, um, remember the uh, well-known chap who uh, uh, turned out to have had a Ponzi scheme in 2008, Mr. Madoff, who made off with everybody's money. Um, and. Uh, if you ask the question, which is a very common question, would it have been good if people had been more trusting of Mr. Madoff? I guess I would say no. It would have been much better if they'd been less trusting of Mr. Madoff. He was a crook, and he's spending the rest of his life in prison, which uh, is, I suppose, a mild satisfaction for people. Uh, so, to me, trustworthiness is far more important than trust. Now, if you think about it, trust is the response. It's the response that we make, and we want to target it well. What we ideally want to do is we want to trust trustworthy people, but we do not want to trust untrustworthy people. In fact, it would be jolly good if we could detect them and then mistrust them. So mistrust has a very important place in our lives, and where people are untrustworthy, the proper uh, response would be to mistrust them. But it's difficult. And trustworthiness is one thing, but judging people's trustworthiness is difficult if they don't let you know. Now, of course, in everyday transactions uh, with people we know well, we can make pretty good judgments of trustworthiness. I don't mean that we never trust people whom we think untrustworthy. I'm sure some of you have met people who had a relative who'd become an addict and who was stealing money. And I can remember talking with one such mother of an addict and she said, but I have to trust him even though I know. And I, f I felt for her dilemma, but the first thing to think about, in my view, is trustworthiness in everyday life and in more complicated situations. And if we're thinking about trustworthiness, I would pick out three things as really rather important. I want to uh, know, is the other person competent? For example, would I trust someone to drive the school minibus whom I knew to be an absolutely erratic driver? No way. And we want them to be honest. Would I trust somebody who I knew took money out of the till to mind the shop? No way. And there's a third thing which you may think isn't so important, but it's reliability. Uh, some people say, but surely that's covered by honesty and competence. I don't think so, and I'll tell you a story that I hope illustrates that. I have a friend, he's honest as the day and highly competent at many things, but he's just that little bit unreliable, you might say absent-minded. Would I trust him to post a letter? No, maybe not. Uh, but on the other hand, I would trust him, for example, uh, to check my manuscript. That's a high order of trust. So that's why I add in reliability. But if, and, and what we should aim for, in my view, in institutional life, is trying to ensure that institutions are such that we can judge whether they and the people who run them are honest, competent, and reliable. If we can judge that, we'll be placing our trust intelligently and placing our mistrust intelligently. Okay, but let, 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 let's get back to the media for a moment. You said uh, a few moments ago that they're getting worse. 
you also gave some very thoughtful and measured comments after the Brexit vote, for example, on the misrepresentation by both sides uh, in the media and uh, just generally uh, of, of the positions, of the, of the appropriate positions. So if the media is getting worse in terms of its trustworthiness, why is that and what can we do about it? I haven't got to the bottom of this, but maybe um, it's something uh, that some of you have thought about a lot. But I think that um, one thing we can put our fingers on and is clearly happening, there is a, uh, a economic crisis in the newspaper world. People don't buy newspapers. We look online, don't we? Uh, newspapers have great difficulty in breaking even or making a profit. Maybe some local papers don't, but they have, and they are more trusted and more trustworthy, incidentally. But there's a real crisis I, uh, of a declining industry there. Maybe they'd be more trustworthy. Uh, maybe, they'd be, maybe they'd make more money if they were more trustworthy. It's a lovely thought, and I hope it's true, but they read it the other way around. They think they're going to make more money if they're more sensational. What's being sensational? Well, being sensational on the whole is exaggerating, cutting corners with accurate reporting so that they both have a financial crisis and they have an incentive to exaggerate and they just can't cover all the news that is relevant. But, but couldn't you say that that's really our fault as the citizens? I mean, we're, we're the ones who are going out and purchasing or not purchasing the, the newspapers. We're the ones who are signing up for various different blogs. We're the ones who are being receptive towards the sensationalists and the polemicists and so forth. Well, may, maybe we are, uh, but it, it is, uh, so, uh, and uh, I think it's very demanding for citizens now to uh, keep the necessary uh, discipline. And, you know, who writes letters to the editor anymore? No, they tweet. Hmm. And uh, the one of the things people are, I think per perhaps unaware of is what's actually going on with social media. By the way, I don't use them, but I did go to the, uh, the all-party parliamentary group on hate speech, and I learned the following, which I think illustrates a lot. They were discussing anti-Semitic hate speech. It's not a trivial topic. As you probably know, there's one MP who's now having police protection because she's had over 50,000 pieces of hate mail. Well, uh, and this engenders a certain sort of atmosphere. They had a representative of Facebook at this meeting who explained that they took down offensive material. A member of the public said, well, what you actually do is after you've had 20 complaints, and I noticed this was in the media again today, you uh, take it down and it's immediately up again. The, what we are dealing with is echo chambers where people imagine masses of people think this hateful thing, whatever it is, we don't have any idea that masses of people think it. We know that it's appearing in masses of places, quite a different thing. So I think social media uh, present us with one of the new challenges. The other new challenge is that uh, a lot of it is anonymous. In fact, much of it perhaps would not get into the public domain if people uh, w had to be identified. Now. Some people will say there's a right to communicate anonymously. I'm not so sure that that right covers everything. And a lot of what's going on is like throwing stones at people from behind hedges. You attack, but you don't reveal who you are. You might say there's a corresponding duty as well. But on whom to do what? Well, there, there's a corresponding duty on somebody who feels that they are um, going to make a statement to be candid uh, in terms of uh, not hiding behind anonymity. Not hiding behind the hedges. Well, I agree. I think if you take part in public debate, you should indeed uh, 
be public about it and say, you know, I, Jane Smith, I, John Smith. Uh, I'm invoking my right as a citizen to exactly, contribute in such and Exactly, and that is what way. it is to be a citizen. It isn't being a citizen to hide behind the hedges and throw stones. So civic um, discourse has taken a rather difficult turn. I'll tell you uh, an amusing story. I was taking part a couple of years ago in a, a debate at the, uh, the Hay Festival, and uh, Arianna Huffington, who edits the Huffington Post, and Belle de Jour. Arianna Huffington had come to the conclusion I've come to that anonymous communication is not civic communication and it's pretty dangerous. Belle de Jour pointed out quite correctly that she'd put herself through a PhD by publishing her anonymous blog as her life as a prostitute. Um, and she couldn't have done it without the anonymity. Well, there's, a, there's one use of anonymity, and it worked for her, and she got her PhD, I think, I think in biochemistry, was it? I, I don't know. And uh, then her, somebody blew her cover, and she couldn't publish her blog anymore. So, um, as we move uh, somewhat uh, haphazardly, but nonetheless, uh, eventually, from Kantian philosophy through to trust, the role of the media, uh, social media, anonymity, and belle de jour, I want to wind up with Donald Trump. Um, oh, Donald Trump, yes. So, and, and not just Donald Trump, per se, because uh, I don't have a huge desire to talk about that, <laughs> but I want to talk about populist movements mm. in general. You, you mentioned hiding behind the hedges. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned hate speech. And there is this sense uh, that you didn't mention of scapegoating, which is quite common in populist movements, which to my mind is very definitely anti-universalist, tautologically one could say. Um, so how do we deal with that as a society? Well, I wish I knew. I wish I knew, because I, I think that these... Uh, it wouldn't be surprising if our legislation had not caught up with our technologies. And so people still will try to produce some of the 19th century arguments for press freedom as though they could take exactly the shape in the era of um, digital media of all sorts and of blogging. And then the whole format in which we tend to think about press freedom is that we imagine there is an editor who is in control of what is said, and there are laws on libel, and uh, there are uh, understandings about confidentiality, and you can't breach confidentiality. We've got a very ramshackle set of laws for dealing with uh, the reality of contemporary communication. And what we want, of course, is to secure freedom of communication, but without exposing people to intimidation, vilification, mm. and hate speech. And we have some laws, but they're very difficult to enforce, partly because of the amount of it that is anonymous, uh, partly for other reasons. Is this more a question of laws, or is it more a question of educating people and engaging people and demonstrating by example what could be done? I think one of our problems with relying entirely on culture, which I agree with you is absolutely essential to have a more robust culture to deal with this, but it's probably not sufficient. Um, it's like uh, uh, the, the old slogan, good money drives out uh, bad money drives out good, and uh, uh, bad forms of communication drive out good. A lot of people feel very intimidated today about taking part in public debate because they've seen, and they're quite right, they've seen the vilification that goes on. I think uh, we know that horrible things happen to people who are uh, brave enough to, uh, for example, become MPs. Uh, I cannot imagine what it's like to get, and your family to get, the levels of vilification that they get. And as we know, one MP has been murdered recently. Uh, these are things that 
I think would have been pretty hard to imagine 40 years ago, even 20 years ago. So vilification is a non-trivial thing because it does uh, rouse people to think that, oh, that's all right, saying that's all right, let's all say that. And that way you get everything from extreme bullying that goes on in schools. I was hearing about an episode this morning of a, a child being radically bullied uh, and uh, all the way round to hate speech against people who are not particularly public figures. I'll tell you a nice story about hate speech. Um, my colleague Mary Beard, who's a professor of classics in Cambridge, was had a troll. Now, by uh, mishap, from the troll's point of view, his name got out. And his employer, with great indignation, sacked him. And Mary got to know who it was, and she made contact with him. And she uh, told him with some clarity why he should not have done what he'd done. And then she said, look, I'll cut you a deal. If you apply for a suitable job, I'll write you a letter of reference, because I don't think it's right. You, you should be unemployed at public expense for the rest of your life. <laughs> so he's back in work. And her, the downside for her is that he rings her up rather often for advice. <laughs> now, you can see that she's a decent soul and that he um, was jolly lucky uh, and uh, it, it's quite an amusing story. Now she's still being pestered by the fellow. Yes, but in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like but, we, but how many of us, I don't think I'd have the, the, the presence of mind to do that. And of course, lots of people are trolled and they never know who the troll is. Mm. It's back to your uh, and the of follow, anonymity. The followers of the troll. The troll is, a, is typically anonymous. Yes. Um, I'd like to move a little bit to immigration now. You've, you've um, written extensively on duties and on the importance of understanding exactly who is responsible for doing what for or by or to whom. Um, you have frequently highlighted the importance of the role of states. We're living in a world now where immigration is... Uh, a very significant concern for people of all political stripes. Um, so, as somebody who has also been involved, as I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, on the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and who has been able to look at things not just from a UK perspective, but from a global perspective, what should we be doing differently? What should states be doing differently or better than they're doing now in terms of immigration. Let me go back to the topic we talked about at the beginning, namely human rights and the right to asylum. Um, I think it's pretty important to maintain the distinction between asylum seekers and migrants. And if you notice the public debate over the last year, it's constantly blurred. Uh, and then people sort of rem are reminded of it and they are, uh, say, oh, well, it's one story about the Syrians. They really are um, asylum seekers. They have a well-founded fear of persecution where they are. But a lot of other people don't. Now, what has happened in the last year is that the distinction has been blurred. And I think it was blurred at an earlier stage when the Schengen countries in the European Union uh, said, oh, well, let's undo the borders between states in, the Sch in Schengen, not Britain and Ireland, but uh, most of the other states. And uh, that actually completely undermines the right to asylum as it is set out in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a right to asylum if you have a well-founded fear of, of persecution in the first state to which you come, quite circumscribed and very often quite manageable. What has, of course, happened is that uh, people arrived in Schengen states, mainly 
uh, Greece and Italy. The authorities there did not bother to record who or when, and they sort of said, well, uh, move on, move on in the direction of Germany. They will not have a right to asylum in Germany because it's only the first state that, could, that is safe that you reach. So they've lost their right to asylum. There's then been an attempt, which, as you probably know, has not borne fruit, to say, well, let's divide them up. I think that's fanciful. I mean, if I'm, uh, 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 suppose I have a well-founded fear of per per uh, persecution. Suppose I'm Syrian, and I'm assigned to, let's say, Romania or Portugal. Well, I think when I get there, I know perfectly well what I'll do. I'll get moving again and try to go on to a place where there's work, and it won't be Romania or Portugal. So uh, the wider moral of this is either you're working with a world of states and borders, or you're not. And globalization has produced a world in which we're sort of shifting to and fro between the idea of there being states that can enforce law and have responsibility, and the uh, and that not being the situation. Does that mean that there's an increasing role for multinational organizations, Brexit notwithstanding? Does that mean that groups like the European Union or perhaps on a larger scale the United Nations should play a larger role? They don't have enforcement powers. That is the, that is the rub in here, that states have enforcement powers. I think it's sort of politically naive uh, to wish the end without wishing the means. In the um, uh, uh, version of human rights that was endorsed in the 1960s and 70s, the idea was that the state's party, the states that were signatory to these agreements, would take on the corresponding duties. Uh, but in this world that we now have of rogue states, failed states, states with porous borders, globalization working in this way and not that way, actually there's no clarity about the, who holds the counterpart duties. Right. So it doesn't work. So the, I guess the question that I would have is if, if I'm sitting there in the audience, or for that matter if I'm sitting right here, which I happen to be, what do I do? What do I do as a citizen recognizing this? How, how can we move forwards towards a, a more progressive and, and happier future, not just for migrants, not just for refugees, but for, for everyone, for ourselves as well. I mean, it, it, that, of course, is, is a sort of question I'm not going to answer because it's not answerable. But you can give a little bit, you can, you can say. Well, look, I, I gave you a little bit just now when I said, uh, effectively, who wills the end, wills you the means. Don't start talking about uh, rights when you haven't thought about duties. So, uh, you know, it would be very nice, but we've got, if we're going to uh, get the rights realizable, we have to have the institutions that can carry the counterpart duties, but what we've on the whole done is to limit those institutions in various ways. Now, all my friends in the, uh, not the, uh, perhaps people who work for NGOs and have, uh, 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 admirable sentiments about respecting everybody's rights, but the people who think that international human rights law can do the trick are, I think, uh, whistling in the dark to some extent because it, the, the, the international human rights law is not competent to deliver the rights because it's not competent to deliver the duties. Time was the states had stronger powers and could deliver. It was clearer what they could and couldn't deliver. It's now not very clear. And what about rising social inequality, a la Thomas Piketty and Capital and so forth? This is also something which doesn't strike me as very much in line with Kantian universal principles. Um, or, it's a or huge, ideas or ethos. It's a huge or? and difficult topic, inequality, and a lot of them. Uh, real nonsense is talked about it. Um, uh, if you look at the rise in inequality, it's, a, it's very much driven, uh, you, you do by the way know that there's been a huge decline in inequality in the last few years. Why? Because of 
things that have happened to the very wealthy. Uh, and that is to say, the rise in inequality was to a great extent the, the um, rise of uh, a class of super rich. Insofar as the class of super rich has declined, which it has in many countries, there has been, but this is a statistical artifact, a decline mm. in inequality. Um, I think myself that although we have to deal with the super rich, uh, it's not the main problem. So what is the main problem? Well, there are a lot of problems, aren't there? Not just one main problem. But I would have thought that uh, people tend to compare the what they say is happening now with what they think or what was happening 20, 30 years ago. To give you an example in the media in the last week, uh, people in their uh, 30s today are much less well off than people who were in their 30s 10 years ago. And that's an increase, it's said, in inequality. I just don't know because I don't, for example, know whether the increase in number of people who have gone to university and therefore begun their working lives later and acquired debt is what's accounting for it. So I think you have to look at these generational comparisons with a great deal of detail. People will say, I was asked this one uh, time recently, in fact, by, at a meeting of Canadian, the a Canadian Bar Association meeting in Cambridge and somebody asked me a question that didn't come at all out of the, the talk that I'd given on that occasion and said, isn't it unreasonable that old people are holding down all the jobs that, and young people aren't getting them? And so I pointed out, and it's a simple point, that um, we had raised the pension age, actually quite a lot. Did we think that the people who uh, now didn't get their pensions so soon, should live on nothing for the interim until they got their pensions. Well, not really. Uh, and uh, talking about inequalities, I think you have to be always very precise. Which inequalities, and are the, in the inequalities at time n and time t and time t plus one actually comparable? And I often don't know. And I've been reading about these generational inequalities in the media recently, and I have to say most of the articles don't give me the basis for knowing even whether the statistics are accurate. Hmm. Um, let me just conclude with a, with a few questions before I turn it over to the audience. Um, we charted aspects of your philosophical evolution. What advice would you have to a young undergraduate or graduate student in philosophy or in the humanities in general today? Talk with lots of people who are doing different things and do lots of different things. That's fast. Okay. Um, this may be an unfair question to ask you, given the fact that you are a crossbench member of the House of Lords, but if you were somehow magically transported to being the prime minister with a majority government, not necessarily of this country, let's pick another country. Let's, uh, let, 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 let's say you're the president of France. Just I'd easily. resign. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or the secretary general of the United Nations. I mean, surely I'd you resign would, faster. You, okay. <laughs> so there, there are personal sentiments, but there is a sense that given your wealth of experience, your breadth of knowledge, your understanding of public policy, um, I think people have a legitimate question, which is, well, what should be done by somebody in, in, in a position of power with the ability to execute, albeit in a somewhat limited fashion, not king of the world or what have you? see, you're beginning to hedge the question a great deal, and I understand why. <laughs> okay, Let, let's say, what would you do if you were queen of the world, then? Um, I'd resign. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, look, um, one of our difficulties is that all over the place, uh, people hold positions and hold power uh, without having much of an idea of what on earth to do. They like the power uh, exactly. and, and they probably have less power than is needed to get something done, but they don't um, uh, recognize that. So, you know, be realistic. I suppose this, this realism is a very s 
central theme for me. And I think that in politics, political life, it's very easy to get into wishful thinking. Let me tell you a story which illustrates this. I was um, about a mile away from here, many, many years ago, I was crossing a road and there was an elderly woman beside me and the cars were going past us. Psst, psst, psst. And she turned to me and she said, you'd need a swivel leg to get across here, which I thought was wonderful. So I've never known what a swivel leg was. And then she said, aorta do something about it. And in my family, that phrase aorta has become uh, one of the things that we uh, uh, say from time to time about people who are unrealistic. That thought they, which they, ought to do something about it. So they ought to do something about the cars going whiz, whiz, whiz past where we were trying to cross. But it's very easy looking at politics from the outside to say they ought to. And I think what we really owe our fellow citizens is identifying the much more practical questions that can be answered. Because um, after you've decided what is the right thing to do, you've got to decide is it feasible to do it? Who can do it? How can it be done? What does it cost? And what do we have to give up doing in order to do that thing which we think is right? And whether it's uh, you know that third runway at Heathrow or that second runway, is it at Gatwick, or whether it is something much more limited and local, uh, whether it's high speed two or cross rail uh, or any of these things, you have to ask those realistic questions. And in that respect, I may sound very boring, but one of the interesting things about Kant was, by the way, that he was a tremendous realist about uh, what you had to bring to politics. Yes, principles that define what ought to be done, but then realism about getting it done, about it being enactable and enforceable. So realism about what the institutions can do. And that's why I have nothing to say when you, uh, if somebody says uh, uh, in a nightmare to me, oh, by the way, um, Mr. Is it Mr. Guterres is not going to be the new Secretary General, it's you. All I can do is resign because I know, you and all know, the Secretary General is in a position where uh, vast expectations swirl around, but he has not the levers and instruments of, uh, that needed to execute what is uh, desired. So politics is jolly hard, and I have every sympathy for people who try to do it and do it well, but, but not when they get unrealistic and content themselves with gestures. My last question is, is there anything in your philosophical career or your career in public policy that you would like to do over again or do differently or do better? Are there stones left unturned philosophically, pathways that you would have liked to have investigated more fully? Oh yes, and, and insofar as I can, I take part in groups that are working on these things now, Such as? not necessarily in Parliament, by the way, but for example, um, rethinking what the corporation is. I think that's pretty important. I was reading this weekend, courtesy of one of my sons, uh, a rather old-fashioned um, writer on management, very well known, some of you may know him, Drucker, American, and I thought, what good sense he talks about corporations and companies and why they need a purpose and the purpose is not the bottom line and you don't settle for neoclassical economics and all that. So uh, yes, that would be some, that's something that in a small way I'm happy to put my shoulder to and I'm sure many others here too. So the huge tasks in front of us, but the thing is to bite off bits, they may be small bits, that actually can be changed. And I have much more respect for somebody who achieves something relatively small, concrete, but achieves it, and somebody who has uh, wonderful notions of what ought to be achieved, but sticks with aorta. They ought to do something. It's not they, it's we who ought to do something, but we can only do small things. Great. Um, I'd like to open things up for questions now. Um, 
Yes, a gentleman way at the back. Is, is there, before I, I do that, is there someone with a mic who's coming around? I don't actually know. It would know. be jolly nice to have a like too, so that we could have eye contact, because as you may not realize, we are looking into near pitch darkness. Yes, there was somebody at, at the back. Yes, that, that gentleman there. Sorry, excuse me. Could, could you please come to a question? Mm. Thank you. So have you unduly vilified vilification? Well, uh, could be. Uh, I think the uh, first thing to be said about vilification is it's a notably unsuccessful tactic. It could raise the temperature, but not much else. Uh, maybe it allows people to let off steam, uh, but it doesn't tend to get things done. Um, on where the law stands and the human rights stand, um, the, as we have it nowadays, the right of freedom of expression, very different from John Stuart Mill's comments on rights of self-expression. Um, freedom of expression more or less protects any content you wish to make public, but it doesn't protect the speech acts, so that if you engage in for example, defamation or character assassination or uh, deception, that will be a matter for legal attention in, uh, as before. Uh, so I think we need to be precise about what the right to freedom of expression is. Um, as for vilification, you can often get away with it because it's not quite defamatory or not quite uh, something else, uh, but it is, a, um, usually an own goal. Yes, person over there in the back. It, it, I think I see um, the, the line of thought you have. I mean, does it help to say one doesn't expect of other people that they be totally trustworthy in all respects at, um, uh, and so on? Uh, trustworthiness is not sainthood. Somebody can be trustworthy from something something quite ordinary. You trust the postman maybe to deliver your letters. 
Um, and it's nothing very grand in that, but it's a trustworthy performance. And uh, you um, trust somebody to have uh, left you a door key when you'd arranged it. So uh, trustworthiness is not an all or nothing thing, and I don't think we should think of people who are trustworthy in several respects as having to be trustworthy in all respects. But it's a matter of judgment um, that we exercise every day in every sort of way. And you know, sometimes you see somebody um, who perhaps is riding a bike along a pavement rather fast, and you think, I don't quite trust them to take the corner around that child. And you pull the child out of the way, whatever it is. Uh, so um, it, it, it's very mundane stuff, trustworthiness. It, the impressive thing to me is how trustworthy most people are for in most matters, and uh, that actually, when a, a society that is working even adequately, not superbly, is a society in which lots of people are being trustworthy about lots of things. That may not quite have answered it, but I, I don't want to build too much into trustworthiness. Yes, sir. Lady, I believe, at the back, it's hard to see. What does the uh, rise of populism mean for the future of representative democracy? I'm terribly sorry that I... Uh, it so what, what does the rise of populism mean for, for representative democracy? Oh, serious stuff, doesn't it? Because the rise of populism is... Um, it's very damaging to democratic debate. So one of the things we were talking about. And uh, I don't see that democracy is really going to work if we can't have serious debate about difficult matters. So um, as I watch mm. Mr. Trump in his more florid moments, sorry to introduce him, uh, I think uh, that is very damaging to democracy. Now, of course, Mr. Trump has a knack of disowning comments he has made. We've seen quite a lot of that. Uh, but I don't think that's really an answer in either um, national or local politics to say, oh, well, I said it, but I, I didn't actually mean it. Um, but is it, is it fair to say that it's damaging to democracy? I mean, if it turns out to be the case, God forbid, that, uh, that Mr. Trump is successful. And if it turns out to be the case, in fact, that uh, a significant number of Americans um, are, are in favor of, of Mr. Trump or anyone else being their president and elect him through a thoroughly democratic process, we can argue whether or not the contemporary American process is indeed democratic. That's a whole other question. But assuming that it is, um, why does it necessarily impugn democracy? It might impugn what you and I think should be done or, or, or our moral well, values or rather, what have you. Rather depends on your conception of democracy as it might depend on your conception of uh, the free press. Uh, um, as uh, several people have observed recently, the point of a free press is not to misinform the, the public. And um, uh, I take it that uh, democracy needs a free press because uh, we need to be able to assure ourselves that we get adequate information about public affairs, uh, not uh, to, that we get uh, highly tendentious misinformation about public affairs. So I don't think it's a matter of indifference for democracy if we uh, poison the wells. Well, I guess my sense, and, and I'll certainly let the questioner respond, but my sense of one aspect of the question, what does the rise of populism mean for representative democracy, um, could be looked upon as what do we have to do to safeguard ourselves from the tyranny of the majority? Yeah, I'm, there may be a link between those questions. I'm just not spotting it at the moment. Mm. Well, populism being the fact that you, we might live in a world where most people, or at least a majority of the members of our society, think that all left-handed people should be put to death. Um, 
And clearly that's something which shouldn't occur or something far less sinister than being put to death. But one can be in a circumstance where uh, there's widespread populism, there are views that, that we would like to say any reasonable person would think would be hateful or immoral or inappropriate or ill-founded, and yet it may turn out to be the case that sufficient numbers of, those peop uh, of the people in that society actually believe them or they believe they're representative, in which case... Well, you know, we uh, let, let me explain to you why I think democracy might be the fourth most important thing um, in public life. Um, it's because it presupposes certain other things. And for democracy to work well, you've got to have... It presupposes order. That's to say it's not, let us say, like the what it's like in Aleppo at the moment. You can't have democracy in Aleppo. You haven't got even the basics of order. After order, you've got to have the rule of law. Democracy without the rule of law uh, is I uh, uh, vestigial, I would suggest. And after rule of law, you've got to have not the full range of human rights, but what are usually called the elementary rights of the person. Uh, so that, for example, uh, you can't be arbitrarily imprisoned, even if the law said so. So democracy doesn't, as it were, come as the foundational good. It comes because we've laboriously built up its presuppositions. When you've got its presuppositions, you can have democracy. Mm. And populism, I suppose, one way of thinking about it is the attempt or the fantasy that you can have democracy without having the presuppositions of democracy. Any other questions? Yes, the gentleman in the red shirt, uh, the third, third or fourth row. Okay, thanks. On the question of trust and populism roll together, I suppose, we've heard quite a lot of talk recently of the need to trust ordinary people. And this has gone alongside rhetoric about uh, the need not to trust experts. We've also had the Prime Minister saying yesterday something along those lines, I'm not entirely sure what she meant, but saying that you basically talk to the effect that we should distrust metropolitan liberal elites and the sort of people who wanted us to remain in the EU. I mean, she herself wants us to remain, but um, you know, the idea is that there's a metropolitan liberal elite that's detached from ordinary people. These people should be brought to book. And the good thing about Brexit, whether we agreed with it or not, was it gave these ordinary people a voice. I just wondered how you would unpack that sort of thinking. I'm sure there's a lot being run together in that, but is it a sort of um, populism that has something not quite nice about it, trying to smear a ruling class without providing any arguments? Or is it uh, a legitimately heartfelt appeal to the supposed fact that ordinary people, whoever they are, have not been given a voice, and Brexit and other things have at last given it them? Um, I, I suspect one has to unpack it into several packages, if you see what I mean. And um, uh, one thing that I would say is that I think um, there has been a um, strong tendency to uh, give credibility to um, not liberal metropolitan elites, but specifically to quite libertarian economic conceptions, uh, which have hollowed out our conceptions of what uh, business life, commercial life, working life are for, uh, so that people uh, are taught, for example, students are taught still in some economics departments, that the purpose of the company is to achieve shareholder value. I would suggest the purpose of the company might be something much more concrete than that, uh, something that one could look at, measure, do well and do worse, but it isn't shareholder value. Although, if they do it well, maybe there will be shareholder value. But, but So I would uh, go along with being very skeptical about a certain strand of economic thinking, uh, which we've all met all over the place. Um, but uh, th there are other parts of this where I uh, don't actually think it breaks down so neatly. And you can say, here's the poison, there's the poison, we should accept this, we should uh, revile that. Uh, so what would my targets be? Well, 
probably um, this extremely abstract econom economistic thinking. Uh, and I think, for example, that Mr. Osborne's communication before the referendum, in which the results of financial modeling were deemed adequate forms of public communication, was uh, just misreading what people will think is adequate communication. And it also didn't work, by the way. Uh, so, uh, of course, on the other side of the referendum debate, we see people who uh, uh, perhaps had better slogans, but had no idea what they were aiming for. And that was another form of deception of the public. And I sat through many hours of discussion where people would uh, say, well, you know, what are we voting for if we were to vote for Brexit? And the uh, Brexiteers had no answer to that. And uh, that is a form of failed communication too. We've had a lot of failed communication. Um, how to get it back? Very hard, isn't it, when our political parties are essentially broken, and the two that have been successful being SNP and UKIP, at the expense, respectively, of Labour and the Conservatives. Uh, but uh, uh, pretty catastrophic on the whole, the, the lack of sober communication with the electorate. And now the political parties are so small, really small, and uh, their claim to represent large swathes of the population is diminished. And I think this is a dangerous situation because here's a Birkin point. Um, do we think democracy can work without parties? Probably not. There's a question there, the gentleman. Yes. You spoke about um, rights and the fact that we understand what rights are these days. Uh, but obviously you're working duty or in, in looking at Kantian duties. Have you got any advice that you could give us in terms of what positive duties as individuals we should be considering? Very good question, I think, because um, we all think we have duties as individuals, and yet the whole tendency of the human rights movement has been to focus on the duties of the states to assure us that the, in the, 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 that the duties are realized or satisfied. Uh, as individuals, um, I would start with very classical things uh, that uh, sort of fair dealing and honest dealing with one another and truth telling is pretty important. Without this, we corrode a lot. Uh, a measure of toleration of other people, even when they seem to be doing extremely silly and retrograde things, is also a pretty good idea. I don't think the traditional conception of what it was to be a decent person is either wrong or irrelevant, and I do not think we can load all the duties onto states and uh, then blame a political class for failing to deliver. Uh, I do understand very much why people feel getting engaged in public life is risky and unpleasant, because risky and unpleasant things happen, as with the one MP murdered another under police protection. But in a sense, uh, the, the world is full of very decent people who um, uh, one admires for, uh, as it were, standing up for the, what they think is right and proper, often in quite tricky circumstances. And we ought to, and, and that's why it's so much easier if we would allow ourselves to talk about these duties as opposed to thinking we could only talk about the rights. And that wonderful phrase, have you noticed the, in po politics today, the phrase, the most vulnerable? Well, you know, maybe there can be a most vulnerable person, or maybe I'll allow that could be uh, a group of people who are the most vulnerable. But when I listen to the political classes talking about the most vulnerable, it seems to range across the population. The most vulnerable people in every walk of life. One last question, perhaps. Yes, the lady in yellow. Yeah, thank you very much for your conversation. And I'm also interested in rights, yeah. 
And I noticed that you mentioned that you think the, real, the realizability of human rights depends mostly on uh, the government's ability or others' ability to bear duties. So I want to ask, on the conceptual level, uh, I mean in the conceptual, uh, when we identify whether we have uh, an alleged right, um, do you think uh, when we identify the rights, we need some, uh, we need um, make sure about the duties first. I mean, uh, the certainties of duties uh, to some degree, such as uh, general content of the duties and the people who bear the duties. And um, do you think it, it is that as long as we can make sure about these general things, we can say that there is someone else who have correlative rights? This is the first question. I'm not quite sure whether you can understand my English because I'm English, my English is not very good. And the second question is, relative, is re, uh, uh, relative to the first question that if you think that the existence of rights presuppose some existence and certainties of duties, then what is the distinctive uh, or individual value of rights? Yeah, um, do we, uh, are rights just the correlatives of duties? If so, maybe we need not only any rights and just to make sure about what duties we have to each other. I didn't get all of that uh, because the mic was echoing a bit and my failing hearing wasn't picking it up. Uh, but I, um, can, did you get the, the main question in there? I, I, um, I, I certainly got the second, second question. Uh, so let me go backwards from the second question. Perhaps you can help me. So my understanding of the second question was if duties are, are a natural uh, correlative of rights, perhaps we should just start from duties rather than necessarily talking about rights. Um, yeah. is, that, is that a fair encapsulation of the second question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, well, we did in Europe for about 2,000 years. Uh, and uh, it, it was a clearer way of thinking, to my mind, because it emphasizes the action rather than, than what you get. And uh, uh, why? I think that my main comment on that is that talking about duties is felt to be very much less charming than talking about rights. People like rights talk because it's about what I'm entitled to, what I should get, what the other fellow should do. Whereas talking about duties is rather cold and boring, and it's talking about what I ought to do. So that, that I, and can we go back? Well, I think we, uh, we probably could go back, but I think we have to realize that it's uh, a tougher, clearer view, but it's also a wider view, because one of the things that was rather good news about the discussion of duties, whether we think of St. Thomas Aquinas or we think of uh, Immanuel Kant or we think even of John Stuart Mill, the utilitarian. So, you know, there I, I take you through the centuries. Um, it, there were two sorts of duties. One sort had correlative rights. They were often called perfect duties. It meant a complete duty, a duty that specifies not merely what I ought to do, or the state ought to do, so, uh, but uh, also who's entitled to have it done. But the imperfect duties, the incomplete duties, were duties where it wasn't specified who the recipient would be. So for example, it allows for a duty of beneficence, of helping others, or a, a, a duty of trying to improve matters, where you can't exactly say, you owe it to this person, not to that person. There are no correlative rights. But I think we lose a lot if we lose that whole spectrum of thought that, that is focused on the things that we ought to do which are not a matter of respecting others' entitlements or rights. As you've said, it's a lot less sexy to talk about a universal declaration of human duties. Than people have tried, people <laughs> have tried, but it, it is less sexy. That is the problem. And uh, on the whole, the things that are big and important aren't always absolutely charming and, and uh, rhetorically vibrant, but that, that's the difference.
Thank you for that question. Well, at this point, I would like to thank our guest, uh, Baroness O'Neill, very much. Thank you. It's been a very enlightening thank you. I would also like to thank Jim Walsh, whom I couldn't see because of the lights, but there he is. Uh, Sid Rodriguez and Deborah Bowden very much for all of their work, and London Thinks in general. And I want to tell you all that uh, the next guest will be appearing here on November the 10th, uh, Sir Roger Penrose, the eminent mathematical physicist. So I welcome you all to come to that and tell all of your friends and colleagues. And uh, I believe there will be an opportunity to have some drinks afterwards in the, in the foyer. Jim, is that that's correct? Uh, it's open? Hopefully. No, apparently there won't be. So go, uh, go somewhere, have a, have a drink yourselves. Thank you all very much, and, uh, and, and good night. Thank you. Thank you.